Thanks so much, Mari. And thank you all for coming out tonight. Um, it should be a very exciting evening, I think, a special event, bringing uh, Sujata Gidla and Neil Mukherjee into conversation. Um, I'm honored to have been asked to moderate the conversation. I'm going to introduce them both, and they'll read a little, and then we're going to sit down and talk for a bit. Sujata Gidla was born Dalit, or untouchable, in the southern Indian state of Andhra Pradesh. Her parents were college lecturers, and she herself holds graduate degrees in science and technology from schools in India and the United States. Despite their education and achievements, her family was subjected to scorn, segregation, and other forms of discrimination based on caste, as their ancestors had been for generations. Her memoir, Ants Among Elephants, published last year by Farah Strauss and Juru, restores her four parents to their essential human dignity by telling their stories. She recuperates history from below through the use of demotic sources, including oral history, family history, the texture of folk customs and folklore. The book is really remarkable not only for the power of its plain spoken prose, but for its frankness and fearlessness. It's an ode to the courage and struggles of her uncle, uh, the revolutionary and poet Satyamurti, and her mother Manjula. But it also turns a critical eye on people, figures, and movements uh, that are beloved. She does not spare her hero or others close to her, and she does not spare India's communists or its founding fathers. Ants Among Elephants sheds brave light on enduring casteism and patriarchy in India. It's not the first Dalit memoir or autobiography, but it has reached perhaps the widest audience with breakout attention from the BBC, the New York Times Book Review, NPR, even the Daily Mail. Writing in the New York Review of Books, Pankaj Mishra praised the book as outstanding in the intensity and scale of its revelations and defiant in the face of endless cruelty and misery and tender with its victims. Sujata Gidle is a rebel, an iconoclast, and a storyteller. As a teenager in India, she engaged in radical street theater, performing songs and skits about unemployment, the high cost of living, and government corruption. She was a member of the student wing of her uncle's Revolutionary Communist Party. At the age of 20, she was jailed for three months for supporting student protests against an upper caste professor who was automatically failing all Dalits at her engineering college. And while she was locked up, police beat her with sticks and ropes and stuck pins under her nails, and she contracted tuberculosis. She recovered enough from that experience to finish her degree and to work as a research associate in applied physics at uh, the Indian Institute of Technology in Madras. In her mid-20s, she came to the United States to go to graduate school. Uh, she's now a New Yorker living in Bay Ridge. Um, and after losing her job uh, writing code for the Bank of New York during the financial crisis, she became the first Indian woman conductor in the New York City subway, subway system. And much of Ants Among Elephants was composed on her laptop during breaks and downtime uh, from the conductor job. Uh, and a retired train operator reviewing the book for the blog of the Transport, Transport Workers Union Local 100 wrote, she writes in a straightforward, almost conversational style. It's easy to picture her swapping stories about families in the crew room between subway runs. Sujata's writing has also appeared in the Oxford India Anthology of Telugu Dalit Writing. Um, please join me in welcoming Sujata Gidla. Uh, this is uh, about my uncle's wedding. He was 23 or 24 years old. Um, and uh, it's taking place in his ancestral, vil ancestral village, which consisted of only Dalits, very backward, semi-savage. Uh, on the morning of the wedding, Manjula was woken by loud cries from the alley next to her uncle Golaya's house in Sankarpadu. She sat up in fright and started praying, Oh, Deva, Jesus Lord, save us. A cousin of hers sitting nearby put her sari end to the mouth to hide her smile. What, Papa? No need to be scared. They're just chasing the pig. When Prasandrav announced his son's wedding to the village, everyone started drooling at the thought of the pig. 
A wedding, is an untouchable, a wedding in an untouchable colony is a festival, and at the center of the festival is the feast, and at the center of the feast is a pig. As soon as a match is fixed, both the bride's house and the groom's house get hold of a piglet, either by buying one in an untouchable market or catching a stray. For weeks, the families raise their pig with great care. A wedding pig is no ordinary pig. It must be treated with respect. No one is allowed to talk harshly to it, even if it should get in the way. Hey, watch your mouth. That's the wedding pig. The families feed it as well as they can, giving it starch water left, left after rice is cooked to drink, or sometimes even cattle fodder. Most untouchable families don't have that kind of food to spare. And the best thing about a pig is that it can feed, feed itself. The staple for pigs in India is what's delicately called malinam, filth. They eat human shit. If the wedding family is too poor to feed their pig, it's not a big deal. The pig simply goes around the village eating shit and gets just as fat. Untouchables will often marvel Shit it may eat, but a pig's meat is the sweetest meat of all. But the announcement of Satyam's wedding meant more than just the prospect of a pig. Prasanna Rao has risen above the condition of all those he had left behind in Sankarpadu. He was a teacher, not a farmhand. Uh, he had lived in cities and towns. He interacted with caste people, with other educated people, people with jobs. In the eyes of the villagers, he was wealthy. He, he owned uh, four and a half acres of land. His son was the first ever college-going man from that village. And now, and now that the eldest and the most favorite son was getting married, there would be a lot of pork at this feast. Prasan Rao, it was said, might even get a pig of that exotic new breed. <clears throat> Only a year or two earlier, a new breed of pig had arrived in the country. They are known as Seema Pandalu, European pigs. They came from Russia. Some call them red pigs because their skin is pink and hairless and smooth. They're raised on farms, in pens, not let loose in the streets. They're fed a calibrated diet and grow many times fatter and larger than Indian pigs. In fact, they seem to have nothing in common with the black, hairy, filthy native pigs. But whenever anyone tries to raise one of these foreign pigs on his own, pretty soon it loses its caste and turns into an ordinary Indian pig. It's pink turning into black, its fat shrinking away as it runs through the streets, wallowing in sewers and swallowing the effluvium. Everyone in Sankarpadu looked forward to tasting a European pig at Prasan Rao's son's wedding. But Prasan Rao's son had other ideas. When the matter of the pig came up, it pained Satyam to realize that his relatives were so different from his caste friends. He had attended many of his friends' weddings while living in Gudivada, and except for Nancharaya, none of them had served meat. Meat is believed by Hindus to be impure. Brahmins, the purest caste, eat no meat at all, not even fish or eggs. Untouchables, being impure themselves, eat even carrion beef, the flesh of cows that drop dead by the roadside of age or disease, which since cows are sacred and cannot be slaughtered, is the only kind of beef that falls to human cons consumption under Hindu law. Middle castes, except for merchant castes, eat meat but never beef, and it is inauspicious to serve any meat at, at all at births, funerals, or weddings. Satyam considered it uncultured and even barbaric to eat the flesh of a pig on any occasion. A pig, to caste Hindus, is a symbol of filth. Untouchables are commonly associated with two creatures, the crow for its blackness and the pig for its foulness. When people, as, when people assembled under the banyan tree to, to plan the feast, Satyam told them there would be no pig. The elders took the cigars out of their mouths. What, what? A wedding feast with no pig? Satyam replied, there won't be any meat. They couldn't believe their ears. The most fabulous wedding they, they would ever attend was turning out to be the worst, worst one they had ever heard of. They wanted nothing to do with it. 
Men, women, and ch children turned and went home disappointed, but Satyam was unmoved. Discussion in the village went on for several days. In the end, the elders came to Prasan Rao with a proposal. How about a pig for the village and hence for the having red people, that is the educated ones? Satyam said, never. Prasan, Prasan Rao took his, took his son's side. He had stopped eating beef in Vizag when he had to hide his caste for the sake of being allowed to rent a room in the house of a caste Hindu family. And now the very thought of beef was revolting to him. He didn't mind pork himself, but he could understand how his son felt. Instead of a pig, he had bought sacks of vegetables and from some, from some kammas whose children he taught in Talaprolu, some strange upper caste flower-based foods, appadams and laddus. The villagers decided to boycott the wedding feast. One thing saved the day. Neither Prasan Rao nor Satyam had a say in what the bride's family could, could or could not serve at their feast on the night of the wedding. Everyone knew Kutumbrav had already been raising a pig for the last few weeks. Whether Kutumbrav had bought his pig or caught it himself was not clear, but it was a black Indian pig. That was the pig the young men of the village were chasing on the morning of the wedding when they woke Manjula with their cries. Manjula went out to watch the agile young men, armed with long, thick sticks and clenching cigars between their molars, running through the village, loincloths pulled tight over their crotches and between their buttocks, their bodies shiny with sweat. One carried a special net. The children of the village, 20, 30 of them, naked, dust-coated, wild-haired, runny-nosed, the girls among them also all naked but for their snail-shelled anklets and the little silver or copper discs strung around their waists to preserve their modesty, ran alongside the hunter hunters. Everyone was screaming as loud as he or she could, and the pig was screeching even louder. Wild with fear, it whizzed past the hus huts like a cannonball, desperate to escape the murderous youths. A cloud of dust rose from beneath its hooves and the feet of the men right behind it. A pig, the pig is chased, instead of just being tied down and butchered to save its blood. blood. The blood, it, blood is what, it, what makes it tasty. The idea is to scare the pig with screams and cries and make it run for its life until it collapses from exhaustion. In Sankar Padu that morning, young women and girls admired the muscles rippling beneath the men's glistening brown skin as they wielded their sticks. The women's eyes ran all over the hunters' bodies, taking in the smalls of their backs, their thighs, their chests, their narrow waists, the lips that held their cigars. Each thought fondly of how, uh, how her, her own man ran faster than the rest, how he tackled the pig expertly to the ground. The men were aware the women were watching, and they tried their hardest to impress them. The pig ran and ran for half an hour until it could it could run no more and finally dropped to the ground. One hunter threw his special net over it and the others raised their sticks and beat the animal half conscious. They carried it to the center of the village and tied its snout shut with a rope. They tied its front legs to a pole and stood it up on its hind legs. The dazed pig looked up at the sky. As the piglet grows in size, its neck soon gets so fat that as long as it lives, it is never able to lift its head and look at the sky. But a wedding pig, in the last moments of its life, gazes skyward at last. Untouchables will say of an un unfortunate man who has lived in poverty all his life, never having had a moment of happiness, but for a small respite at the end when his sons get a job and, and is finally able to take care of his parents. We do Pandilanti Vadandi Chachpoye Mundu Aka Sanichu said. This fellow is like a pig. He saw, the, uh, he saw the sky for the first time at the end of his life. On that wedding morning, the men responsible for preparing the pig gently roasted the still living pig and carried it to the bride's house. For lack of a cutting board, they unhinged the front door and laid the pig on it. 
two elders, Uncle Nallaya and cousin Abednego, were invited to do the honors and carve the pig. A few years before, a Brahmin in Gudivada who worshipped Gandhi had spread the principles of nonviolence among all and sundry, especially the cruel and, and the crude untouchables. One day, <coughs> he found himself in an untouchable colony where a wedding feast was taking place. Before the man could lay the pig on the door, the Brahmin pushed his way forward and laid himself down in the pig's place. He wept. How can anyone with a heart hurt, hurt this voiceless animal? Are you not human? human? Haven't you heard the teachings, teachings of our great spirit, Gandhi? He pleaded with the untouchables to cut him up before they could take a knife to the creation of, the, of gods. The youth in that colony, full drunk, pinned the Brahmin down and held a knife to his throat before their elders in, intervened. The Brahmin scurried off and never tried that again. Good thing he didn't stay to watch what they did next. If he had, he might have fainted. Manjula herself couldn't bear to watch as the wedding cooks separated the intestines, which would make a tasty saute. Other special parts were carefully removed, the heart, the brain, and the liver. A curry made of it out of these is not meant for everyone. A portion is given to the pastor who performs the wedding, and the rest goes to the wedding families. For days, the pig would feed the whole colony. They'd, they'd make soup with its bones and curries out of its hooves and testicles. People would swear how divine it is to eat pork fry while drinking. Chicken is nothing, they'd say. But the affair of the pig is more than its taste. It's the circus of hunting it, the feats of the men. It's heroic, it's romantic, it's erotic. It's a metaphor, it's, a, it's rhetoric, it is deeply philosophical. But these are, these are all mere superstructures. At the base, it's economic. The cheapest meat for the cheapest man on earth. It's a devastating, gorgeous passage. Thank you for reading it. Okay, so I should admit at the outset that introducing Neil Mukherjee is for me kind of an act of filial piety. <laughs> I joked with him recently that he was my fairy godbrother, and he brushed this off uh, with a characteristically self-effacing, while witty play on words. Uh, so Neil and I met eight years ago in London while I was uh, working on my book, Cooley Woman, and trying really hard to sell it. Um, it was a brave little book that could, but mostly back then, it really seemed like it couldn't. Um, by then, Neil had won awards and accolades for his debut novel, A Life Apart, uh, but a few years earlier, he'd gone through, I think, a similar ordeal in pitching an unconventional book about marginalized people to mainstream publishing. Uh, so he got it. And he did much more than understand and encourage. He also championed Coley Woman, even helped edit it. Um, that he's such a good literary citizen, enabling stories from outside the establishment, wouldn't surprise anyone who knows his work. Uh, Neil is the author of three novels, and each exercises the moral imagination interrogating power and nationalisms. His characters are border crossers, they are transgressors, they're servants, they're women mistreated by their own families, they're people who are, uh, to steal a phrase from Neil, in the blind spot of even God's vision. Uh, but they're also an abusive mother-in-law, the entitled darling son of a wealthy family who rapes a tribal girl, an impoverished and uprooted peasant who beats his wife. And Neil writes about all of them with a critical, unsentimental eye, but also with a compassionate sense of how history, economics, and power shape and misshape human behavior. Uh, he has a devastating gift for rendering cruelty beautifully. Um, even when his characters are not victims, but victimizers, he leads his readers to the ultimate border crossing from ego to empathy. He movingly inhabits the distress and disorientation of his characters through prose that is complex, elusive, and often weightless. Neil delights in experimenting with form, engaging in conversation with other texts and other writers, and in crafting metaphors so intricate and precise as to be almost measured with a protractor. Uh, 
Um, Neil was born in Calcutta uh, and left India for England as a Rhodes Scholar when he was 22. Uh, he has a PhD in Renaissance literature and a master's degree in creative writing. Um, he currently divides his time between London and the United States where he's been teaching creative writing recently. Uh, his first novel, A Life Apart, which won the Vodafone Crossword Book Award in India and the Writers Guild of Great Britain Award for Best Fiction, shifts between the perspective of a gay and undo undocumented immigrant in late 20th century London and that of an English spinster in colonial Bengal. His second novel, The Lives of Others, tells the stories of three, three generations of a Bengali family of paper manufacturers, its servants, its workers, and its scion, who joins the Maoist guerrillas organizing peasants against landlords in the countryside. Uh, the novel was shortlisted for the Man Booker Prize and won the Royal Society of Literature's Encore Prize for Best Second Novel. Please join me in welcoming Neil. May I have a lecture? No? Okay, no, that's fine. Thank you very much for that um, very generous and warm introduction. Um, this is my first book tour in the US, and this is my last event uh, of that book tour, and I'm very, I'm very honored to be here. Um, and thank you all for coming. There are many familiar faces here, but I can't see you because the light is too strong in my eyes. Um, I'm going to read uh, from... This is a very difficult novel to summarize, even by my bad standards of summarizing books. Um, it's in five sections, and each of them is written in a different style and features a different protagonist. And the sections don't quite join. Uh, and that's the whole point. Um, this section that I'm going to read from, uh, the central character, uh, there are two central characters. One's an animal, a bear called Raju, and his master, Lakshman. Um, and Lakshman uh, goes around um, the streets of small town India with this bear, which he's training how to dance on, on I mean, he finds the bear, bear cub, and the cub grows up, and he's trained this bear cub to dance. It's an it's it's a barbaric practice which is officially banned in India, but in India, ban is one thing and it's enforcement another. So even when I was growing up uh, in the 70s and 80s, I I I saw bear, uh, you know, dancing bears and their masters. Um, there's one thing that you need to know is that Lakshman's wife is called Gita. Lakshman comes in one day to discover Gita cooking egg and potato curry for dinner. The children get one egg each, Lakshman only potatoes and gravy. Are, where's my egg? He asks. Gita is silent. You didn't hear me? Where's my egg? The pared down reply, only for the children, comes in a manner that makes it obvious to Lakshman that she's hiding something. He asks again. The same reply is returned but this time impatiently, with some heat. Lakshman feels an old, familiar roiling start up in him, but it must get rid of the surface confusion before it can get going fully. Why didn't you buy eggs for me? Silence. You want me to force the answer out of you? Didi gave me eggs for the children. It takes Lakshman a while to work out that she's referring to her employer, the woman whose husband's house the big new one with the terraced garden past the old bungalow by the hedges near the turning for the road up. Gita goes to clean every day. City people, rich, holiday homes in the hills. Holiday home in the hills. How come? Lakshman's confusion has been swept away. Her wish, Gita says. She thinks I don't give enough to my children to eat. She thinks we are beggars, Lakshman says. Gita, who has sensed from the beginning the approaching combustion of the very air around them, remains silent. Any words would be fuel. Why are you so quiet? Did you go begging? Did you go and say? Here he mimics her voice. Didi, Didi, the children are hungry. The children don't have enough to eat. The children have become still as stones. Their plates are polished clean. Gita, steal, Gita steals herself against what's coming and sends up a quick, Desperate, silent prayer. Lakshman is trembling. His eyes have gone small. The mimicry continues. Didi, I'm begging, begging you for my children's food. They haven't eaten for three days, Didi. Save us. 
The palm of his right hand, fingers curved inwards to imitate a beggar's gesture, suddenly stretches open as he leans forward, thought fast, and slaps Geeta full on the face. She utters a short cry and topples over from her sitting position. No amount of experience in reading the signals, the small eyes, the silent crackle in the air, the subtle tremor in his hands and voice has ever prepared her for the first blow. The girl, Sudha, starts whimpering. Lakshman turns to her. She cowers. He barks out, shut your mouth or you'll be next. Just as suddenly the rage leaves him. Maybe it's Sudha's crying or Gita's prayer. He says to his wife, if I catch you bringing in food or anything those people give you, I'll break your face. Understood? Silence. Understood? He roars. Gita walks out. Raju attempts to chew the wood of the fruit crate, which he has now outgrown. Children and adults no longer, no longer congregate outside Lakshman's back garden to throw stones and prod Raju into dancing. His novelty value has almost dissipated and the long, fruitless wait to be entertained has edged into boredom. When, the children ask. Soon, Lakshman answers. He does not know himself. The Kalandar, Salim, who knew all the secrets, didn't tell him. Does he need to train the bear? How? By dancing in front of him and waiting for him to imitate? By getting hold of a damru and playing it to him? He does not know, and at times this fills him with panic. Is he saddled with a useless pet? Instead of bringing in money, will it be a steady and continuing drain on what little he earns? Another mouth to feed? Just before the onset of the rainy season, he builds Raju a makeshift shed of wood and corrugated tin stolen from the next village, with plastic placed on the roof under bricks and stones. His family huddles inside their two rooms, sometimes for days on end. The vegetable patch is washed away. In its place, there is an irregular rectangle of mud and puddles the color of milky tea from which they have to salvage the junal which they grill on coals and eat every day. The insects are so numerous in the mandua flower that Gita is defeated by the business of sieving and picking them out. Mold spores everything that can be eaten and objects and surfaces and damp clothes too. The dense vegetation cladding the surrounding hills manages to look not green, but one with the grey of the skies. Hearing a crash one night, Lakshman is aroused from his thin sleep. His first thought is that Raju has been attacked by a marauding panther. He goes with a torch, and in the weak, faltering light cast by fading batteries, he can make out Raju standing on his hind legs and the roof collapsed onto the mud. Rain falls on the tin and plastic making a sound slightly different from the noise of the monsoon on the shed when it was standing. In the morning, Lakshman discovers that Raju has chewed the upright pieces of the thin, long wooden sticks that had held up the tin roof to his shed. The wood is in splintered little pieces, not far from where the four pillars had stood before. Raju's wet pelt is covered generously in mud. They leave him out in the rain for days until his battery of grunts and yowls drives a hot knife through Lakshman one night and he comes out with his thin guide stick which he has fashioned as best as he could following Salim's description and guidelines and brings it down on Raju's flank and head and face and si sides wherever he can and on the tree trunk too for he cannot see to aim in the dark. Raju cannot run or hide because he's chained to the tree with the rope that is only four feet long, so he lets out a run of cries that span the spectrum from roaring grunt to high-pitched shrieking without any punctuation, one modulating into another seamlessly. The noise wakes up everyone and the children begin to cry. Gita runs out and shouts, Stop now, stop! He'll keep making that hellish noise unless you stop. She takes the stick from his fevered hand and flings it into the dark. In the grey, drenched light of the following morning, Lakshman comes out to find Raju covering and whimpering at the sight of him. But Lakshman hasn't forgotten or forgiven yesterday, so Raju goes without food. The cub whimpers all day, digs up the earth around him while emitting that sound between grunting and snuffling that Lakshman is becoming familiar with, then continues with the whimpering. Lakshman comes out, bent on teaching him a few rules, the beginning of his training. He shouts out the shh so forcefully that it ends in him spitting. Raju goes quiet. Encourage, encourage, Lakshman raps out. Stop that din, stop. Raju blinks, looks, up, looks down, then away. 
Lakshman feels a stirring of joy inside him. It is stopped at the moment he goes inside and hears Raju beginning, be, begin his whining again. He comes out and repeats the shushing and shouting. Raju obliges by falling silent for the duration of Lakshman's presence. Today, I have won, Lakshman thinks. Geeta says, he'll keep up this racket unless you feed him. He's crying from hunger. No, don't feed him, he says. He'll get food only when he stops the noise. He needs to learn this lesson now. He won't stop, she says, I'm telling you. The lid, that familiar grinding weight, descends early now, when he's awake and alert, watching his children and his nephew and niece and his wife and sister-in-law. He cannot bring himself to focus on any one thing for long. It's as if his attention, something inside him, is bent on wandering and will not, cannot be moored. Gita reads the slackness and goes out to throw some cucumber and ragi rotis to Raju. Loud slurping snuffling noises like an army of animals at a trough over in seconds. Then silence that lasts and lasts. Everyone inside is holding his or her breath, including the two toddlers, Ajay and Meena. Lakshman refuses to look at Gita's face. Later in the night, with the sound of the rain dotted occasionally by a whimper or a guttural croak, an image comes to Lakshman, an image that helps him hold off the weight falling on him again. It is the recent memory of, wit of witnessing Raju standing on his hind legs. He holds on to it as sleep takes him. Thank you. going to have a conversation now. If you'd join us, please. Oh. <laughs> All of us together. Yes. Yeah. Okay, so uh, let's begin with the beginnings or the origins of your books. I'd like you to talk a little bit, not about what led you to write them, but who led you to write them. I mean, correct me if I'm wrong, but in a way, they both seem to be homages to literary or political father figures. In your case, Neil, a state of freedom is a riff on V.S. Naipaul's In a Free State. Uh, and Sujata, Ants Among Elephants, is at least partly a portrait of your uncle, the uh, poet and revolutionary Satyamurthy. Um, so do you think of these books as homages? And if so, um, does the framework of homage ever break down? You want to go first? Well, actually, it's me that led me to write the book. Um, and, and the reason what, what led me to write the book was um, uh, I was born in Untouchable, and uh, untouchability is kind of like racism here, uh, but without... Uh, you know, they don't look, look different. High caste people and low caste people, they look the same. Um, so I used to wonder, uh, how did one, uh, how, how do some people fall into untouchable category and the others into Brahmin categories? Um, I wanted to know about it, but it was too shameful to ask anybody. Uh, and also I was too young to uh, know how to form a question like that. So I made up, um, uh, you know, a reason for myself that probably it's because we were Christians. Christianity is a minority religion. Hindus are the majority. And the majority always looks down on, on, the, on the minority. That's how I explained my untouchability to myself. Uh, but as I grew up um, in my teens, I came across these Christians that were um, very wealthy and as privileged as any Brahmins I knew. So, um, I, I was still, uh, I, was, uh, I was once again left with questions. Why did we become untouchables and why are they Brahmins? Um, but still I was too ashamed to ask anybody, even my parents. Um, it was only after I came to America I was able to get over the shame because I met people here who are, who are not Indians and they saw me just as an Indian, not an outcast, Christi uh, outcast uh, Indian. And these people, uh, they're the 
uh, you know, the epitome of privilege, white men from upper middle class, uh, well-educated, they didn't see me def differently. Um, and they were my friends. And they were also um, passionately anti-racist uh, anti people. Um, in fact, one of my friends, uh, he stopped talking with his brother for a slight racist remark for 15 years. And he's still not talking to him. And I, I was just flabbergasted that one could be like that. And I really wish that I could see such a thing in India. Anyway, I'm going on too long. But anyway, uh, so uh, I wanted to know why some people become untouchables. I was struggling with that question. So I called my mother and I asked, asked her, do you know? And she started telling me family stories. And those family stories became, uh, I noticed that they were very interesting. I showed, showed them to my friends and they all loved it. So that's when I decided that it's going to be a book, become a book. Thank you. Yeah. I, I find it quite difficult to answer that question, how, how a book uh, comes about. I think the book chooses you uh, rather than you choosing the book. I, 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 I feel I want to write to make some sense of the world. And by world, I mean not my world. I'm not interested in myself. Uh, I'm not interested in writing about my milieu uh, uh, unless I can s look at the fractures and their contradictions of that particular milieu. Um, I suppose there is a very strong political motivation in me for writing the kind of books that I write. I think the act of writing itself is a very political act. Um, I am fed up with the novel about relationships and marriage and adultery, uh, which seems to have completely consumed the Anglo-American world. And I try and push against that. Um, and, and I was trying to work out something about why the term political novel has become, is used with such contempt, uh, uh, in, in such a sneering way. Uh, uh, people always seem to equate the term political novel with something so tendentious that, you know, it's, 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 almost, it's, it's very close to sloganeering almost, or, or, or carrying placards and walking out in the streets and demanding workers' rights or something like that. I think the political novel is a very, very complicated thing, and there is politics behind why the term political novel has fallen into such, not desuetude so much, but you know, why it is used with such contempt. I feel you know, uh, many celebrated novels are, uh, and, and celebrated in the Anglophone world, are uh, uh, inexorably political novels. I think a novel like American Pastoral by Philip Roth or Human Stain, they're such incredibly political books, I feel. Anyway, so I, of course I wanted to write a political book. And the theme of displacement, the theme of lives which appear to be invisible to most people going about their business, uh, um, I think that appeals to me a lot. Uh, uh, and you know, recently uh, um, I, was, I was doing an event last week, and I don't know from where this, this, uh, this poem, which I had read when I was a child, just fell into my head. And I remember it still, and I think that has given me the underpinning of of all my books. I mean, I'm only three books old, but you know, I I, I feel it's given me the underpinning of all my novels. It's 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 a Langston Hughes poem called Harlem, and it goes, um, uh, "What happens to a dream deferred? Does it dry up like a raisin in the sun, or does it fester like a sore and then run? Um, does it sugar and crust over like a syrupy sweet, or does it stink like rotten meat?" Maybe it just sags like a heavy load, or does it explode? And I wanted to catch both the moment of explosion in my previous book, and I want to catch something about the pre, the sagging like a heavy load in this book. Um, so yeah, so this, this is some kind of thinking that went on in, in, in my head and heart while I was sitting down to write State of Freedom. So I was totally wrong. No looming father figures in either book. <laughs> oh no! I mean, there there are father Did figures, it? of course. You know, you know, you asked a question about whether you, uh, 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 yes. So, so who's the father figure? My uncle uh, Satyamurti comes off as uh, the father figure, but I didn't plan it that way. As I was telling you, that um, I called my mother to find out. Uh, the story of our family. And she told me, talk to your uncle because he's 
uh, he was six, he's 60 years older than my mother and he knew more. So I called him, but he was such an extraordinary man. Uh, so even if you just try to tell facts about him, it becomes uh, like, uh, you know, portraying an extraordinary, fabulous man. Uh, but it was not intention, it, it was not my intention to make him either the central figure or to portray him as a father figure. Uh, and also, I didn't try to make him, uh, show him in a, I didn't try to show him in a negative way. Uh, it's just by presenting facts. Uh, I, I, I wrote about things that, I wrote things that looked negative, but not to me. And what I loved about that portrait was how honest it was. I mean, you admire him, but then you're able to look at him objectively, and in a way, he was sort of a pampered figure as well, right? Yes, and he, he, he also replicates all the uh, cast trappings of upper cut. Like, he has a haircut and nails clipped by someone else and stuff, I remember. And I thought, you're so undiluted in your portrayal of him, and I admired that so much. Yeah. Thank uh, you. Yeah. Okay, so um, I personally think that the women uh, in both books sort of steal the show. Uh, and gender and patriarchy are themes as central to your narratives as caste or master-servant relationships. And I mean, Egg Curry oddly makes an appearance in both books as it relates to entitled or violent husbands. Um, <laughs> and Ambedkar, um, um, the Dalit leader who uh, helped write India's constitution, saw the control of women's bodies and behavior as critical to maintaining caste. And the flip side of that, of course, is that women's freedom is critical to annihilating or breaking caste. And I wondered if you could each share a story or two that show women in your books who are either breaking caste or challenging hierarchies. And, okay. and the piece you read, Neil, sort of speaks to that, the passage you read. Yeah, so, of, so of the five sections in the book, uh, one is based on a on a cook um, um, who, who has come from a different state and has traveled to the big city of Mumbai. And she works in middle class homes cooking for them. Um, um, and there's another woman in section four of the book who is sent to work as a domestic help who are still called servants in India actually. Um, and she's sent off at the age of eight to, uh, uh, to the nearest big town from her tribal village uh, to work just, you know, cleaning and, and, and sweeping and uh, basically doing all the odd jobs. And uh, these two people actually exist in real life. So, and I've given them their real names in the book. Uh, so Renu the cook used to cook for my uh, brother and my sister-in-law. And she really did save up money working in homes in Mumbai, living in a slum and sent her nephew to do a PhD in particle physics in Heidelberg. So that's her story that I've told in the book. Millie's story is more fictional. She comes from Jharkhand. She, she was taken out of school by her mother, as you read in the book, and she was sent to work in all these little towns until she fetched up in Bombay. And, um, but I've made up more in, in her narrative. And, and they are in the acknowledgement section of my book. I mean, they'll never be able to read it, which is, which is a very sad thing. So wh while I was talking to them and thinking, my God, what extraordinary lives these people have, I want to write about them, and I want to write about them truthfully and unblinkingly with as much dignity and weight I can give to each of these people on the page. Uh, um, I was also reading the work of um, uh, uh, Ellen Barry, the New York Times journalist who was posted in India, and she was writing a series of quite extraordinary pieces about how uh, uh, um, um, the, en the, the entry of women into the labor force in the bottom rungs of society, uh, like in menial jobs, how this was troubling actually traditional patriarchal hierarchies. What happens when a woman who has traditionally been seen to only like, you know, stay at home and breed and do all the you know, domestic work, and the man goes out and earns the money, what happens is the woman if the woman has earning power, how does it trouble and make turbulent, very entrenched structures of power, for example? Uh, so, um, so it was important for me to look at these people not just as uh, uh, victims, but also as agents, and agents in trying to exercise 
as much freedom as they can within the very constrained palette of choices that they have. And Renu actually does that. Uh, she pushes back in, in ways that I love, in subtle ways, like she, she spices the food the wrong way on purpose, yeah. right? Yeah. 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 And Sujata, your, your mom also experienced some of this. Uh, caste and uh, women's oppression in India are inextricably linked. Uh, they're not separate oppressions, they're together. Uh, but uh, as Ambedkar said, but the thing is that caste is the independent variable. And it's out of caste that um, women's oppression grows out of. Caste, as you know, um, is dividing people in the society into different groups and keep them strictly segregated. So in order to keep the segregation strict, in order to not blur the lines between castes, it is necessary that there is no intermarriage between castes. And this is the reason why there is so much um, you know, limits put on women's freedom in India. That is the basis of women's oppression in, in, in India. So unless caste is abolished, there, there will be no true freedom for women in India. And the feminists don't recognize that. They think that they can achieve equal rights for women within the existing s system. It doesn't work. And in my uh, book, uh, my mother is, uh, you know, as many people said, steals the show. But uh, there is uh, that person, um, Manika Rao's wife. She's an upper caste woman. She falls in love with a lower caste teacher of hers, math teacher of hers. And the entire family, uh, politically and economically powerful family, they send cops to hunt him down, to kill him. And they, they get officials to uh, nullify all his uh, uh, degrees. He had a master's degree. and. Uh, he, all his degrees from uh, high school to uh, university degrees, they were all nullified. But this caste girl falls in love with this man, and they endure all of that against all odds and um, live together. And my mother, on the other hand, uh, she subjected herself, uh, she just completely submitted herself to uh, impersonal life, uh, to women's oppression, as well as casteism. Uh, for example, she left all the decisions about who to marry, when to marry, and what to study uh, to, to her father and her brothers. And she, she thought it's because they, they, she thought because they love me and they will do right by me. And in fact, they did, they put restrictions on her because they did love her. Um, and it, in the similar way when her upper caste Brahmin co-workers uh, made any comments regarding her caste. She just adjusted to that. But on the other hand, when it happened to somebody else, she's, she was very militant. She still is. She, she would never stand if anybody made um, derogatory comments against uh, untouchable students of hers. And uh, she is a very famous public speaker. She, she makes fiery and uh, uh, militant speeches against caste and women's oppression and special economic zones and farmers' problems and all of that stuff. But uh, ironically, in her, in her personal life, she subjected herself to both women's oppression and caste oppression. And this woman, in personal life, she uh, went against all odds and married an untouchable man. But except for that factor, she was completely casteist. And there's this uh, interesting scene also where your mom is interviewing for a job and all of the people interviewing her are upper caste and she has to define what democracy is and she, she lets go completely and yeah. with critique, which yeah. I thought was amazing. Yeah. Yeah. That's what I was saying. In, in, in public life, she was very anti-establishment and very militant, but when, it, when it's her personal life, uh, she really is a very meek um, Indian woman. I think we can open it up to questions from the audience now. You took up too long. I'm getting comfortable. Uh -huh. Hi. Um, thank you so much to both of you and to Gaitra for moderating. 
Uh, I had a question for Sujata. Sujata, I was wondering how did your um, family members and your you know closest neighbors or uh, immediate community in India, how did they react to this book? Because it, it has obviously gotten such great um, reviews and reactions from all over the place, including abroad and also within certain sections of Indian society. But I was wondering how your immediate people received it. Um, except for my family members, everybody reacted neg negatively to the book, uh, the people in, in our circles. It's either casteism because they couldn't stand the fact that a Dalit woman untrained in writing, untrained in literature, wrote a book and it became famous. Uh, that was very, very hard for people to start digest. And secondly, my uncle's political uh, rivals, they did not like that he's again being resuscitated and brought back to um, you know, life. Uh, they didn't like that. And they, they have a lot of uh, uh, weight, social weight uh, there. So they're actually stopping the book from being translated into Telugu. And then there are people who are too ignorant to understand writing a book is a big thing. Um, and that's how it, it is. But people who read about the book in uh, newspapers, it's amazing that they would do detective work from one fact that's mentioned in the paper. They will go around making connections and make like eight hour trip to meet my mother. And they would bring the reviews with them. And some of them would fall, in, uh, fall on her feet, fall at her feet and say, uh, you're the sister of that man. So even though I don't know you, uh, you deserve to be, uh, you know, uh, whatever it is. Uh, and uh, my family members, they're all very happy and we, they feel they're validated. Again, it's the shame of telling untouchable stories. Now that New York Times wrote about it, uh, they don't feel that, sh that much shame anymore. Actually, they don't feel shame anymore. Neil, I have a question for you. So when you write about other characters, especially real characters, how do you, as a writer, make or go through the process of giving them dignity and not crossing the line to being a voy like a voyeuristic person? And how do you make sure that you're not exploiting their experience or who they are um, and actually give them um, the dignity and integrity that they are and have? that what uh, writing this book uh, has done w was, uh, you know, when I was growing up and at other times, we had family feuds like, oh, that aunt is evil and this cousin is uh, worse and that kind of stuff. But when I was writing the book, I had uh, the, rec the, the distance between me and the Indian society where those things happened. And I had uh, sort of a bird's eye view and then also, because I'm writing about caste and class, in my mind, the only, uh, only crimes and, uh, uh, you know, mm, what do you call, uh, shortcomings, um, they are just reduced to class and caste uh, outcomings and enmities. And all these other feuds, uh, uh, you know, with the neighbor or with the cousins, they all were washed out. All that remains to be angry about is caste and class. And that's how I was able to, you know, write about them in that manner. I feel, I disagree very strongly with identitarian uh, notions of writing. Uh, I think it's actually the moral duty of the writer to get out of himself or herself and inhabit other minds. Um, most people who have jumped onto the identitarian bandwagon saying that only I am entitled to write about my experiences and no one else's, the converse of it is you will only be writing forever about yourself and your own circle and you're never going to be able to imagine other lives, other minds, which creates for an entire balkanization of like human community. Um, particularly at this time when, you know, um, uh, people seem to have been blindsided by recent political developments, 
I, I feel it's happened because we have grown increasingly confined within our own bubbles. And I think we, it's time we should look closely at the politics of what this kind of identitarian writing entails. It actually entails creation of more and more hermetic bubbles. The duty of the writer is to go and write about whatever subject she or he is interested in. The, tr the trick is to do, of, of, of course, with that freedom comes responsibility. You, you are, it's, it's your duty, you're enjoined to the duty of writing about, these, about other lives away from yourself truthfully, without blinking. Uh, if you can't do that, then you, you shouldn't be in the writing game at all. So how I do it, I, I imagine these things, I talk to them, and I just hope I'm right, you know? So um, if I had to write about myself, believe me, I have a very boring life, you wouldn't read my books. One more thing is I feel much more privileged uh, than all those people that I wrote about, and all I have for them is compassion. And that's one of the things. Hi. Um, I have a question about, um, well, both of your beautiful excerpts involved animals. Um, and both of them, I think, held a kind of metaphorical weight um, of seeing how animals are treated as similar or different to how um, fellow people are treated. So I was wondering if you could comment a little bit on how uh, the animals in your piece um, figure in discussing hierarchy among people, um, or as kind of a, you know, um, does the treatment of the pig have anything to do, does the treatment of the bear have anything to do with uh, the treatment of people that we see as less human? Yeah. Well, uh, actually, I, could, I had to control myself from breaking into tears when I was reading that, because that entire episode shows how casteism reduced these, these men and women uh, to animals, to savage people, people who are uh, growling for food. Uh, and, uh, and also there is a, a sentence or two about how the, the fate of the pig is compared to the fate of those people? I, I'm, I, I'm less interested in how human-animal uh, relations, relationships uh, uh, reflect uh, or, or, or uh, replicate um, um, hierarchies and, and power relations within um, human beings or amongst human beings. Um, I'm, I'm getting very interested in the idea of animals and animal minds and other minds and, and um, uh, I think I was at a, a, at a very impressionable age when I read Peter Singer and recently the work of J.M. Kutsia has been moving towards, actually for a long time now, he has been trying to work out something about morality, uh, human morality by thinking about an human relationships with animals. And I'm very interested in that. And um, it, it kind of carries over my, or extends my burgeoning thinking about um, how uh, uh, power relations work. And um, I'm, I'm very struck by Peter Singer's uh, uh, sentence that animals are creatures who are entirely in our power. And therefore, it is an absolute moral necessity for us to treat them well because they're entirely in our power. That's a very powerful sentence, actually. Uh, uh, you could think of it as a foundational basis for a more egalitarian society. I think there's one. She's had her hand up for a while. Um, this question is for um, Sujatha. Um, but um, one thing that really struck me about the book was that it um, very honestly talked about the ways in which caste elites and Brahmins act as gatekeepers and very explicitly um, uh, maintain those um, strict boundaries. And um, one of the things that especially like, um, I'm curious about is the publishing industry, like much of <laughs> the, uh, other major industries in India, 
has, um, is an over, has an overrepresentation of caste elites, especially Brahmins. Um, and the kind of um, politics of being gatekeepers there. Um, I'm wondering, like, with your experience um, talking about your book in India, um, interacting with the literary establishment there, um, what was that like? I, I'm very sure that if I had write, written this book in India, it would never have published by, have been published by uh, commercial publishers. Uh, uh, you know, there is a saying in Telugu, unless you pour the water through the conch, it doesn't become holy water. So it's because of the success in the West that it caught on with the, uh, with the commercial publishers in India. But luckily, uh, the readers were not like that. Uh, there is a great, uh, tremendous uh, response from uh, um, readers of all castes. Uh, I'm very heartened by that. Uh, but I, I still think that, you know, uh, the publishers uh, in India, they still go where the profit is there, not because they have any kind of uh, social obligation to get a river, to represent everybody. In fact, you know, it infuriates me when I see all these people benefiting from the book in India, the publishers, the editors, the publicists, uh, the head honchos of uh, publishers, and uh, uh, the, the journalists who write uh, reviews, and the TV's interviewers, they're all upper caste, all. And I would say at least 95% of them are Brahmins. And, and it's a, a shame that even a book written by an, a Dalit and a passionate Dalit, a passionately anti-caste Dalit, uh, cannot give Dalits and low castes uh, a chance to, uh, you know, write about the book or, you know, interview me or uh, publish me or translate me. None of that is happening. There is not one single Dalit. I don't know about upper caste, other upper caste, but not one single Dalit was sent as a, an interviewer. Not one single Dalit was given uh, uh, the job of editing. Not one single Dalit was, uh, uh, the, has been a publicist for my, for my work. That's really very, very uh, sorry state of affairs. And when they wanted to do the audio book, I was hell-bent on having a Dalit uh, do the, uh, do the, do the um, audio reading it. But apparently, it requires special training or something. And I looked far and wide for somebody from my choices were Dalits, lower castes, and Muslims, because Muslims in India are oppressed people right now, but I couldn't fi find anybody. And I also looked for black people in, in India, in, in America. I couldn't find anybody. And it's not just the publishing industry in India. The journalist Akar Patel uh, uh, did uh, uh, um, an analysis of the top five people in, like he looked at 50 companies and across the, uh, uh, across the industries and 95 or 99 percent of them, all the people were upper caste. And in India, upper caste equates with upper class. You know, there is no question about that. So, um, I'd, like to, I'd like to add one more thing. And the cynicism of upper caste people, especially the Brahmin people, people, a person who uh, calls himself a born-again Brahmin, uh, jumped on the bandwagon and wrote a... Uh, review of the uh, review of my book, and he's an utter casteist, a Brahmin supremacist, and yet uh, because it's a chance for him to get get himself published in Wall Street Journal, he wrote it. And if you read that review carefully, you will see upper caste tropes in that review. That's that's uh, I felt like you Brahmin bastards, you are benefiting from a Dalit book. If I could uh, take mo moderator's privilege and ask a question. Uh, so Jata, you, uh, you said that you would have been happy also to have an African-American person do the audiobook. Um, what parallels do you see between caste in India and uh, race in the United States, or the African-American experience in particular? Uh, for uh, for uh, Dalits, uh, it's an instinctive gut feeling to, uh, uh, to identify with uh, blacks in America because uh, 
there are two situations that uh, make them uh, similar concepts because uh, in caste, it's the segregation, the discrimination comes because of your, uh, you, you, you inherit your social status through birth. And it's the same thing in uh, America. The black people, even the lightest black people are black people because their birth, they are, their status is people who have, uh, you know, ancestry in people who came from, uh, you know, Africa. So the social status in both cases is determined by birth. And the second thing is seg segregation. And Dalits, they live segregatedly outside. And uh, in Jim Crow, uh, black people lived separately. But even now, um, you know, discrimination in uh, housing is rampant. I have co co-workers who, who tell me all the time. They fa face discrimination in housing all the time. And those are the basic similarities between caste and race. But then there are surface sim similarities, such as in caste, a, a lower caste man can never ma marry an upper caste woman. And I'm reminded of uh, Emmett Till, uh, a black uh, youth who was killed uh, in the South because he was supposedly whistled at uh, a white woman or something. And these things, these similar similarities are not coincidental. The segregation requires that black men should not be marrying white women and lower caste men mar should not be married. And then there are separate drinking waters and there is uh, uh, discrimination in, a, um, you know, uh, and the f finally, it's the death row and imprison it, uh, prisons. The prisons in America are overwhelmingly populated by black people. And it's the same thing in India. The prisons in India are overwhelmingly populated by Dalits and um, uh, Muslims. I think we have time for maybe one more. Hi, uh, thank you. Um, for both of you, what's a book that has really influenced you that we should all buy after this? Uh. <laughs> um, yeah, sure. <laughs> I read your book too, so. <laughs> This is very difficult to say because there are so many books. Um, uh, do you want to go first? <laughs> I can't. This is very difficult. Um, I can't. Siddhartha, please help me. Say, say, say something. Um, I, I can't talk about influence because influence cooks away in the part of the writer's head which he or he doesn't have any access to. I strongly feel that. We can talk about what books we like and what books we do not like. But to talk of influence is, a, is, 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 is for other people to do. I don't think writers should talk about in influence at all. So uh, I feel I love the work of the Irish writer Samuel Beckett. Oh my God, I unbelievable. Okay, we, we are both going to recommend Beckett to you. Uh, uh, but I don't feel in en like he, he has influenced me in any way because, because Beckett was the only person who could write in the way he did. If you want to write like him, you immediately become sub-Beckettian. And then years passed, and then somebody suddenly pointed out in a review in Wall Street Journal, actually, that um, there is something Beckettian in the relationship between Raju and Lakshman. I thought, oh my God, okay, uh, right. So, so I, I was not aware of it. So uh, yeah, Beckett, I think that extraordinary trilogy uh, of his Malloy, Malone dies and the unnameable, I think we could do worse than that, I feel. <laughs> so, yeah. um, I mean, in the, in, the, in the vein of my book, I would say uh, there is Independent People. It's a big, big uh, novel, a saga written by Halder Laxness, uh, Icelandic uh, writer. Uh, I think it's beautiful. And he's also, he also writes from a communist background. He was a Stalinist. And uh, he was also, he got no Nobel Prize. He right got the Nobel Prize. In yeah. the days, Nobel Prize were given to communists. <laughs> yeah. Now they're given to economists. Oh, actually, you know, after he got the prize, the CIA had uh, snooped on how he was spending his money, you know. Uh, anyway, uh, 
uh, that book is, you know, Icelandic saga. It's like a really long book, and it's about a poor peasant who buys his freedom, and he farm, he buys a croft. I think croft is like a farm or something. And he and makes his family do this against their wishes, yeah. and the whole project yeah. is doomed to yeah. failure. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Yeah. It's, uh, it's just beautifully, beautifully written, and I could never use that style because that was fiction and not mine is not, was not fiction. There, there's one more book I want to recommend, and this is the, like the intersecting area between me and, me and Sujatha. It's by a Hindi writer who died last year called O.P. Valmiki, and the book is called Juthan. Oh, and it's published by the NYRB. It's quite an extraordinary, extraordinary account. And once again, a bottom-up account of being at the receiving end of caste inequality. Actually, your book reminded me a lot of Juthan, actually. So, yeah, yeah, you, you must. Yeah. And then there is, uh, <laughs> I'm sorry, anyway. Uh, I don't, you know, I'm not conscious of imitating anybody, but uh, I think that I suspect that I imitated uh, J.R. Ackerley. He wrote uh, a Hindu holiday, holiday yeah. Hindu spelled with uh, D U. Oh, oh, oh. Uh, and uh, he also, like everybody else is saying, you know, uh, how could he write uh, without denigrating people and without praising too much, just uh, unsentimentally. I think he wrote that way, uh, and yet he was uh, not looking down on the colonial subjects. It's a very funny book. It's a travelogue. You must read it. Did you read his book on the dog, the novel about the, my dog, Tulip? No, you know, oh, like every time I write, I read the second book of a book, uh, the author of a book I liked, I, dis I get disappointed. What? So. Beckett, yeah. what? <laughs> Beckett too. Beckett too. I read Murphy and after that I didn't read anything. Yet. Murphy's like, wait, 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 Murphy's like not like, like Murphy's, like, like nothing he ever wrote. It's a sort of one-off book. And then he became Beckettian after Murphy, I think. We could talk about this forever, actually. I think we've got uh, one question from Facebook. Yeah? So who? Hi. Hi. Um, yeah, OK. So on the live stream, there's two questions for Sujata. Um, so I'm going to read both, and maybe you can choose which one uh, interests you the most. Um, one, how do you see casteism manifest in the South Asian diaspora vis-a-vis -vis back home in India? And the second question is, as you may know, it's becoming common for caste apologists to argue that there's a crucial difference between Varna and Jati. Some insist that the caste system is actually fabrication of European colonialism and was produced by the British. What is your impression of this claim? First question, caste is alive and it's brought to America from India and uh, they do everything to perpetuate it. Uh, immigration, immigrant groups, you know, they're ostensibly based on the nationality, you know. Uh, Indians should have one immigrant association, you know, celebrate their culture and uh, their language and festivals. And India has 21, at least 21 different languages. Okay, you expect 21 different immigrant associations. But for my region, there are more than 10 associations. What's the need for 10 associations for people from the same culture? It's because they are caste-based. These immigrant groups are in, in reality caste networks, and uh, they lobby for themselves uh, with Democratic Party, some people, and Republican Party, some others. And uh, there are these people actually trying to build a colony for themselves in Detroit. Uh, they're going to buy a huge plat of land and buy pl uh, sell plots only to their caste people. And then there are other peoples who call their organizations with caste name, Telugu Brahmin Association. How would Americans feel if somebody has a group that says white supremacist association? Would that be acceptable? <laughs> there, is a, there are several. There are, but you know, they don't get, uh, uh, you know, they don't go scot free just uh, as, as Brahmins would do that. And uh, these people, uh, some of them are crude, uh, ask you what your caste is, and some of them are like, uh, Oh, you know, uh, what do you eat? Oh, what, what do you wear in your weddings? Or, oh, you know, they, they try to, uh, you know, deduce it from uh, these, this data, or else they will just go and ask somebody else from your region. And if th their older parents in parties, they are direct. 
these people beat around the bush, but their parents are not like that. And the second question is, yeah, caste. Uh, caste is uh, just because it was consolidated 2,000 years ago, it doesn't mean it's ancient. It's a very living thing, and it evolves. It evolved, and it is still relevant in the sense that some classes benefit from it. And uh, the British definitely uh, molded caste for two reasons for their own kind of exploitation, market-based crops, that kind of agriculture. And when they needed slaves, they didn't have to uh, constitute slaves from uh, you know, a group. There is untouchability available right there. So they used it for their purposes. And the second way they used it is divide and rule, at which they are the you know, experts. Uh, so, uh, but then the other thing is that these uh, Hindus say that, oh, it's all British people, it's all, we didn't have caste before. That's bollocks. Uh, caste was there and uh, they used it. The Muslim, Muslim rulers used it. And after that, British used it. And after the British, it's the brown sahibs that are using it now. So on that note, uh, <laughs> can we please give Shujata Gitla and Neil Mukherjee a hand?